Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the Foreman Community Demo. I'm on the farm, I'm a developer within the Foreman project and I'll be hosting the demo today. As usual, we have some updates to share with you, some topics I want to hear your opinions about and some new things we've been working on to share with you. Before we get started, this demo is all about sharing the latest updates and answering your questions. So we want everyone to participate please feel free to ask away, drop your questions or comments in the IRC chat at the foreman or use, well, this time we don't have YouTube live chat, so just the, the foreman IRC. Um, our topic like, included uh, 12 demos, so we have a lot to cover this time. Uh, I'll share a quick update from the community uh, so we can quickly move on for our demo. And we are happy to announce that once again, Foreman will be will attend Config Management 2024. We opened a poll in the community to hear which topics interest you the most. So check out the full details in, in the community post. And since the submission deadline is next week, and we don't have a lot of votes yet, unfortunately, so we encourage you uh, not to wait any longer with your votes. Um, and while we're on that subject, I would also like to mention that FOSDEM has already published the list of homes uh, for this year, and soon they would publish also the stand for this year. Uh, so we hope to see you there as well. Uh, the next topic um, is about the Foreman Chat Platform consol Consolidation. Um, the update we have is that the community guidelines have been updated, and the cleanup of both match recruitment was completed. Um, there are no more Libra chat users, so everyone who wants to stay in touch should migrate to Matrix by December 15th. That was all for me from the community updates. Um, let's move on to our next demo today, which, be, which will be presented by Chris. So Chris, whenever you're ready. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Nopar. Yeah, this will be quick. So let me share my screen here. Uh, let's see, share now. All right. Let's not wait till that shows up. Yeah. All right. So basically, um, in the if you have on your form and proxy, if you have content that has been is no longer relevant anymore, you can reclaim the space. And so, in, at, for the longest time, that was only available in the UI. So now we added it to Hammer. So you can see here if we do. We have the command here in hammer capsule content, reclaim space. And if I do, uh, we can see what parameters it takes. If we do, whoops. We can see that it takes the, you can do an async task or you can wait for it. You can pass in the name or the ID. So what we're gonna do is just go ahead and do an ID of two. because I just have one smart proxy. We'll ignore the translation stuff. It's because it's a develop box. If you're on production, you wouldn't see that. So we've kicked off a task there. And if we do it with async, we should get the task back. Yeah, so we've got the task here. And then we could take that and we can pop that into the web UI and, and monitor the status. Mine's running really quick because I only have like one repo that I removed off of it. So, uh, but that's all I have. Let me stop sharing now. Thank you, Chris. Um, next up, unless we have any questions, but this next up is Kaya. Uh, hello, I'd like to quickly show you uh, a little fix. Mm. Oh, you may have noticed that on some pages, the bookmarks were opening uh, to the left side, so some long names weren't visible. Uh, this is now fixed and you can easily scroll and see all names. Um, if you ever see any other problems with the bookmarks, do not hesitate to contact me. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. We can move on to the next one, which is Jeremy. Uh, feel free to ask questions if you have even about previous topics. But next up, next up is Jeremy. Thanks so far. Okay, I will share here. 
Okay, hopefully everyone can uh, see my screen and hear me. Please uh, tell me verbally if you cannot. Um, so, hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm Normally I work on Catello, but lately I've been working on uh, the Foreman code base. And I want to tell you today about the uh, new host overview page. Um, so we are going to eventually replace uh, what you're looking at now, which is the old host overview page. Uh, there's a couple of big reasons for this. One is uh, it will allow us to bring visual standards up to date with uh, Pattern 54 and uh, a lot of the uh, pages we've been uh, updating throughout the app. And then secondly, it, it allows us to take care of some technical debt uh, that we have on old pages like the content host uh, UI, uh, where we, we use an ancient JavaScript framework that's no longer really supported. Uh, so this will allow us to get rid of those old pages eventually. Um, OK, so this is the page we're replacing. How do we access the new page? Uh, there is actually a setting for it. This will be in Foreman 3.9 and Catello 4.11. Or uh, if you're feeling adventurous, you're welcome to go install the Nightlies and play around with it now. Um, OK, so our setting is show new host overview page. And if I set that to yes, we will see what we have so far. Um, OK, so it does require page reload. While that's happening, I'll show you this other tab here. So this is what it's going to look like eventually. Uh, we we did a full audit with Maria of all of the actions that you can do on the host overview page. And uh, we came up with 35 of them in total. Of those 35, we narrowed it down to seven top actions. And then of those seven, this first iteration uh, contains about three of those actions. So now that I've refreshed my page, I'm going to go to the all host page. And now we see what we have so far of the new page. Uh, so I'll briefly go over what we've built into this page already. Um, so the first off, the basic page infrastructure, we um, we had a lot of really good uh, implementation in Catello of uh, uh, multi-page item selection and select all. So we've we've ported that over to Foreman. And so you can see here, I can select items across pages. And if I move between pages, I can, uh, it doesn't lose my selection, doesn't lose memory of that. I have the uh, select box that you are probably familiar with. You can select the page and I can also select all items. And then uh, all of our actions are going to, to work properly with this. Um, OK, and I, we also have autocomplete search. So um, you can search for a host just like you're used to searching for any other items. Uh, your bookmarks are, are uh, working as, as you are used to them in, uh, in all the other pages. And then one thing I think is really cool is this now uses um, React links instead of uh, you know regular A tags. So what that means is when you click on a host, it's really fast to go to the host details page and back. Um, before this would take a few seconds, especially in a development environment, but now it's nice and quick. Um, okay, so we've added a few actions here. Uh, one is the schedule a job button that you might be used to. It now works with select all. So instead of sending a uh, list of host IDs, it now sends a host search. And uh, it works pretty well. So yeah, I see I go to my target hosts and inputs here. And I apply this applies to the same three hosts that I just had selected. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the other two actions that we've added are uh, change content source and delete. So change content source was actually a pretty straightforward a pretty straightforward one to add because that page already works with uh, multiple hosts. Uh, so we just updated it to take in that search and we can see here's my two hosts here and I can do my change content source feature just like I'm used to. And then finally the, the basic, basic action that we've added is uh, multi-host delete. Um, 
So if I want to delete two hosts, I have this dialog here. It comes up. I must check this box in order to enable the delete button, else it's not going to be enabled. Uh, there is a, a handy link here to the relevant setting about deleting the VM and its disks. This, te uh, this text will change depending on what that setting is set to. And then if I want to go to that setting, uh, this is actually an improvement from the last page. It actually searches for that setting for you. So you go right to the setting that you would need to change. And then, of course, we've also added the single delete host over here on the right kebab. So, uh, All right, so I've deleted my two hosts, and uh, that is what we have so far. We plan to add a few more actions very soon, uh, including host build and uh, errata apply. Um, and we'll continue on for the next uh, couple of releases here. So uh, that's what I've got. I'll see if there are any questions. I'm sure Marek has some questions. What is your gut feeling estimation on the first Foreman release that will have this new experience enabled by default? Uh, that's that's a great question, Mark. And so our, our plan is to do this the same way that we've done previous new pages, which is at first it's disabled by default and there's a setting and you can turn it on. That's how we're starting out. And then once we have most of the actions available or uh, once you can do all or most of the stuff that you could do before, um, then it'll flip around and the default will will switch to the new page and then finally eventually we'll remove the old page completely um well based on uh i don't know we just did one epic with two or three actions and there's 35 i don't know how many of those 35 we want to complete before we flip the default or if we just want to complete the top seven and say those are just the essential actions we'll, we'll have to decide like when when we've completed enough to to flip the default over like i think it'll the question is will most users get more use out of it um yeah seven seven sounds good so it, in that case i think we can get the next seven the top seven actions done in the next uh foreman release so foreman uh 3.10 maybe if we're uh, if we're really on top of it um, probably Foreman 311 if we uh, come into something unforeseen, which we always do. Right, I think we have one question. Yeah. <laughs> From Adam. Oh, Adam. Yeah. Do you like to read it? Um, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Adam. Oh, oh, me? OK. Uh, my question would be, what's the plan around the selectable columns, which are currently page-led and therefore ERB-based? Uh, do you have any plans how to use them as is or re-implement that completely in the new modern technologies? Um, Arthur is actually working on that right now. Oh. Um, I don't know the details of his implementation, but I think uh, what we were planning to do, like we already have that the hammer, the table, user table preferences. We're planning to use that existing infrastructure, definitely. And then just, um, you know, figure out how to use React with that. I'm sure Partha can tell you a, a more detailed answer later. Yeah, great. Um... So Samir is the next one, um, and it's always great to see yeah new improvements to their UI. Uh, if we keep improving it and you know, just updating, yes, that's great. And Samir, next up with smart project content UI. Hey, Nofa, thanks. All right, uh, so. Uh, I hope I'm sharing my screen now. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to demo today, and this will be available with Kettelo for 11, uh, is the new Smart Proxies 
content page. So let me navigate there. So if I were to go to a smart proxy and look at my content tab, so this is uh, the new UI you'll be seeing in for 11. And I have done some demos, uh, Ian and I, over the last uh, couple of months on this page to go over like individual details. But overall, what you'll see, so this one has a last sync, which is still running. So we have made some improvements around this last sync. Uh, so you can see different times for different environments. This was a bit uh, broken because we were not tracking which environment IDs are being synced in which capsule content sync. So now we have, so if I go to a capsule sync task, so this is synchronized smart proxy task. If I go to the input of this task, we are now tracking which environment ID was synced in which particular task. So you can target one particular environment ID, or you could have a complete sync, which picks up all of the environments tied to that smart proxy at the time. And using this information, we can now uh, distinguish between tasks uh, for particular environments. So in the future, we hope to add uh, an action, which would be to allow syncing directly on the UI. We have this feature on Hammer. So let me show that. So with a command like this, Hammer Capsule Content Sync, and if you specify the lifecycle environment, this will target a particular environment to sync on the smart proxy. And now we can target those tasks on the UI itself. And Overall, on the new UI, you'll see expandable sections for individual environments. So you can drop down into the content view. You can look at what repositories are available and what the actual content count on the particular smart proxy is against this repository. So if you're not seeing the correct counts, you can probably figure out here. Uh, and I think that's about it for this page. Uh, we also have NA. If some environment has never been synced to a capsule, then you'll see NA. And you'll see an in-progress icon, success icon, et cetera. All right. Uh, next thing, one small thing I wanted to show, because we had some issues with this. It came from a bugzilla. So, let me show the Irata page first. So an Irata has two dates, issued date and updated date. So the thing about these dates it is it does not have a time or a time zone information. So this is a string, basically. And what we were doing in satellite was we were trying to get smart with this and add time zone information to these dates, which did not have any such information. And what that was doing is basically on like our Irata pages, it would add some time zone information and then that would lead to like being a N minus one date in some cases in some time zones. So it would show like October 19th, for example. So we have fixed that. We have removed the time zone information from those two particular fields. And now you should see what you see on the Irata details page. Uh, and one more small update is we have added a validation rule to uh, repository syncs. So we, uh, so in Ketelo, we have repositories which are always by default in the library environment. So if I go to some repository here, so this repository has the ID seven, and I should be able to sync this repository because it lives by default under the products. But we also have repositories under content views. So if I were to go to a content view, go to a version, so if I were to go to version four, we also have repositories here. 
So these repositories, if you link to it, if you go to this repository, it will take you to the library repository. But in the backend, we do have copies of these repositories per version. And if you were to like get the IDs of those, which we do expose in certain APIs and certain Hammer results, and you try to sync those, now we stop you from doing that. And you should be able to see a message that you are not allowed to sync those repositories, which belong to content reversion repositories. And that's about it for me. Right, so we are just one question for Marek. Okay, so Marek asks, is it planned to populate the last sync and for also in smart proxies list page so one does not have to go proxy by proxy to see the status of the sync? So the list page today, uh, let me go to smart proxies. So the list page here looks like this. We do not have a last sync uh, column here. We could add it. However, uh, like we saw, there can be like uh, sync tasks, which are for all environments, like this, where you pass in like all of the environments, or it could be one particular environment. So showing all of that information on the list page. So I'm sure our UX team and Maria can figure out a way to do that. But yeah, we don't have that currently. Uh, all right. I don't see any other questions, so I'll stop sharing. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Samir. Thanks a lot. And next up is Ian uh, with Smart Proxy Content Counts in Hammer. Hello, hello. Thanks, Nofar. Let me get my screen shared. So my presentation is going to be very much related to Samir's. Um, and he just showed this UI, so I don't even really have to show too much. But what I'm going to be showing is the hammer side um, of capsule content counts, or I should say smart proxy content counts. Um, so just to show my environment here, um, I have three environments that are on my smart proxy. And in these environments, we have varying repositories. Not all of them are the same. So for example, in this um, precipitation environment, I have my nice zoo repository that has some packages. And the other ones, we only have file content. So if you prefer to use our CLI, you can also get this information. Let me show you how. I'm going to switch over to my terminal here. So. What you're going to want to do is you can run the hammer capsule content info command. Let me just make this a little bigger. And pass it the ID of your smart proxy. And when you run this, I'm doing the debug flag so I can show some interesting data. But you'll see a whole bunch of information about your smart proxy and what is on it. So it'll be listed by lifecycle environment. And then each lifecycle environment will list the related content views. So for example, what we have here is for my precipitation lifecycle environment and my content view name test view, we have three repositories. Um, we have a file repository, which has three files. We have my zoo yum repo that has 32 packages and four errata. And then we have another file repo that also has three files in it. And you will see this repeated for every lifecycle environment and every content view. And while I'm here, let me just scroll up and show you some of the raw data that's coming from the API. If you see here, we have the content counts stored um, as a big old uh, JSON blob. So you can see here we have repository. Well, it starts here with uh, content view versions. You have an ID for the content view version. Then you have your repositories, an ID for the repository. And then you can see your counts. So you, we have, for example, this one. This repo had three files in it. 
We also have metadata that we send along so we can actually tell uh, what repository we're talking about in the UI, where it fits in with the uh, environment and such. And so you get an environment ID, you get a product ID, you get a content type, and you even get the library instance. For those of you who are more uh, technical into Foreman, you can tell where the library ID is. So if you're looking to do any sort of API automation, we hope this could also help you achieve your goals with keeping track of what's on your smart proxies. And that is all from me. Be happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Ian. Looks like we're clear. I don't see any questions. And so meanwhile, we can move on to the next presentation, which will be shown by Adam. Actually, Adam has two topics. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, just a moment before I share my screen. Uh, and we'll, we'll get going really, really shortly. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So uh, the first topic is about remote execution and some things that we removed and some things that we fixed. Uh, remote exec oh, the screen you're seeing right now is Foreman 3.7, so not the latest and greatest. Uh, but I will demonstrate a point in there. Uh, Remote execution had a so-called concurrency control uh, since I don't know, quite some time ago. Uh, in the job wizard, uh, it had two tunables. One was the concurrency level, and the other one was time span. You could use those two tunables either independently or together to manage how many, well, on how many hosts the job can run at once. Uh, this was written a long time ago and relied on some assumptions which over time stopped to hold. So uh, if you use this on 3.7, in specific scenarios, you could run into some issues such as the job just hanging after the first 100 hosts or so, or where the limit was, well, when the limit was used and the job already executed on first 100 hosts, it could get stuck. Uh, the other issue was if you triggered a job with a limit and then you restarted your services, the job would resume, but from the point where it was resumed, it would ignore the limit completely and it would just run unbound it and do whatever. So uh, to resolve this situation, we, and I already said, we removed some things. So I'm already pointing at the thing we removed. We removed the time span tunable. This this one is, is gone, but we left around the, the concurrency level. The concurrency level acts as a as a hard limit. You just put in a number and Foreman will make sure that you know it, it runs the job on at most the number of hosts you put in there. So I'll switch my tabs into a newer Foreman. Uh, this is nightly. And if we look into the advanced fields, we can see that the time span is gone. It's gone. It's gone from the UI. It's gone from the UI. It's gone uh, from the API. It's gone from Hammer. So there's there shouldn't be a trace of it left anywhere. Uh, the only thing that is left is the concurrency level. And I'll show you in a minute, just to give you a bit of context. I'm running a script. I have uh, roughly 100 hosts. And I'm running a simple script which just sleeps for up to 30 seconds and then it finishes. So I have 100 hosts, so the appropriate or the nice limit to show things is around five, uh, just so that we don't have to move across pages all that much. Now, if I kick this off, we should see that 
it won't actually be running on more than five hosts at a time. We can see it slowly picks up. It's at two. And in here, we can see that uh, three already succeeded, two are running, now more started running. Uh, I must explicitly say in here that uh, when you use the limit, it doesn't mean that there will be always exactly n hosts running. There's a there's a slight delay between a host finishes and the next one can start. So even if you set the limit to five and we have still like 90 hosts to go, it can happen that there will be only four running at a time for a bit until things catch up. Uh, in this regard, it behaves a little bit differently than the original implementation did when it worked. Uh, but this, this felt like it's worth the, the trade-off. This should be much more reliable than the old one was. And if we trade a bit of, let's say, latency for, rel uh, for reliability, then uh, I would say it's, it's worth it. Uh, this should also address the issues I mentioned earlier. It shouldn't get stuck. If you restart your services, it shouldn't you know, just go on its way and execute everything immediately. So overall, this should be hopefully better than it used to be. <laughs> All right, uh, moving to the other topic. Uh, recently, we added some email notifications, uh, some more email notifications. If I go to, to my user and sorry, I'll just uh, grab a temporary email. All right, so let me submit and go back. Uh, namely, we added four email notifications around actions related to content. So you can subscribe that if those actions fail, you will get an email notification. This is purely opt-in. It's not enabled by default for anyone. It's just an option that if you want it, you can. So uh, to go over them, there's content view promote failure. So if you promote your content view and it fails, you'll get an email. There's content view publish. So if it fails, you'll get an email. Uh, there's proxy sync failure. So if you're using your content and it gets synced to your proxy and it fails, you probably guessed it by now, you will get an email. And uh, the same thing applies to repository sync. So there are four new actions or four new things that you can subscribe to and uh, be notified if they fail. Uh, to demonstrate this, I'll subscribe to the repository sync failure because it's the easier one to demonstrate. So I'll just submit that. And in here, I have a product called Arusitska stuff. In, in there, I have the only the best things repository, which points to, to a URL which doesn't exist or doesn't resolve. So if, if I sync this repository, it will fail and I should get email. So if I kick that off, we'll wait for a bit until it actually has the chance to fail. Uh, while we are waiting, oh, that was fast. <laughs> okay, so uh, it failed, which is what we wanted in this case. Of course, you as users probably won't like to see that, but every now and then it happens and it's better to know about it than let it go unnoticed. So if I look into the temporary email, I can see that I received a mail that says that repository only the best things failed to synchronize. Uh, here's the subject. Um, it's a little bit small, sorry. It, uh, the email carries some basic information about the thing that actually failed to happen. So uh, it says what the action that was attempted was. So 
try to synchronize the repository which belonged to a specific product into a specific organization and failed. There are links to, to the repository, to the product, and to the task which actually spawned this email. And a brief recap of the actual errors encountered, which in here clearly says that uh, host does not exit.com does not uh, resolve. The information you get is slightly different based on the action that actually failed. So you won't get uh, information about product when, I don't know, content view publish fails because it's not tied to a, a single specific product, but you will get uh, content view information instead. Uh, if I go back to my foreman, uh, the other thing I wanted to show you, and in here I'll have to cheat a little bit to actually make it happen. Uh, we added yet another email notification, and that is this long-running tasks. Uh, there is a thing in, in foreman or in foreman tasks, to be precise, which runs daily and midnight and looks at the tasks in foreman and it searches for any which are uh, either which are paused or running for more than two days. Uh, we expect that everything you do with Foreman and Catello should be able to finish within two days. And if it does not, it's at least suspicious and you should probably know about it. Uh, this this thing about the long rank tasks isn't exactly new, but we we reworked it a little bit in the last I don't know, month or so. So now it behaves a, a, a little bit differently. Uh, the thing that is special about this one is that administrator users and organization admins uh, get this enabled by default and they can opt out of it while other users have the have the option to opt in and subscribe to it. So in here, I'll subscribe. And as I said, I, I'll have to cheat a little bit because it runs daily at midnight and we don't really have time in this demo to, to wait for the midnight. So I'll just trigger that from the console on the background. And, whoops. and hopefully, if I look into tasks and search for long, we can see that there's this one, which I just triggered. It will start it right now and it finished in zero seconds, which is kind of odd. And it succeeded, which is expected. We can see that it delivered the email to two users. One of them is the user with ID six, the other one is with ID four. You can see the, you know, the parameters of the check. So it checked for the interval of uh, 172,800 seconds. So those are those 48 hours it checks for. It was looking for tasks which are either running or paused and it found a single task. And here's the query that it used. If you wanted to you know, double check what it's seeing, you can just take the query, put it into the search box, and you will get the same data. Uh, if I go back to the inbox, I can see that I actually got an email from it. It's, it's this one. It says that there are tasks pending since and the date and the time. Uh, there's some brief description which recaps the states and, and the time and so on, and the table of the tasks. And yeah, that's that's about it, I guess. Uh, I'm afraid I went a little bit over time. So okay. <laughs> sorry about that, but uh, I hope it was helpful. I think so. I don't worry about it. Uh, just one quick question from Ian. Is asking for the emails. Is it just the entry task type that is being watched for, like action, catello, repository sync, or it's a sync failure email? 
Uh, just a moment. Anything? Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty much just wondering that? how the email failures are tied to the tasks. Just thinking from a a maintenance standpoint, so we don't accidentally break the uh, the email notifications in case we change tasks. Uh, you got me there. Sir, get hello. I think the task errors are tracked only at the parent task level, so repository sync. Uh, and I think we are expected as plugin users to like filter that error up so that the parent task fails, and then it will be able to notify. OK. Like for the repo sync failure, was that introduced in Foreman or Catello? It's in Catello. Ah, lovely. OK. That's fine, then. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid we are using a little bit different nomenclature, which makes things a little bit hard. Uh, but I guess we can follow up uh, outside the meeting. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Adam. And we can move on to our next topic, which will be presented by, by Leos. Uh, convert to rel analyze template. All right. I'll just share my screen. Mm -hmm. All right. This one. Yep. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm today. I'm going to talk about new template in remote execution called Convert to Rel Analyze. Um, basically, this is very useful tool and command that uh, useful for the users who are planning to convert from, let's say, CentOS or Rocky to the Rel. Uh, the template itself is pretty simple. What it does is. Uh, checking some conditions like you know running under the root or inst uh, if the command convert to rel the tool is actually installed and after that as you can see uh, we run simply convert to rel analyze command that will do some checks and tell us uh, about the status of the system and if it's actually ready for uh, converting or not uh, running the script is pretty simple uh, if I will go to my foreman, go to the host's index page, and here I'll select the schedule remote job. From here, I can select the job category convert to rel, and you can see that here is the analyze job template. I'm not going to run it because that's going to take some time, and I don't want to spend here like 20 minutes just watching the output of the console. So I already run it before, and for example, in this case, uh, you can see that there is some license agreement, and here it actually, you know, failed quite immediately. And you can see that the analyze job quickly, you know, found that I'm not on the latest uh, version of the CentOS. Uh, here you can see CentOS Linux of version seven point. Eight is not allowed. So what I had to do is run yum update and get the CentOS to the latest version with the latest kernel. So after that, when I run it again, uh, here you can see that on the right now there is way more checks happening. And if I will scroll down, it's going to be maybe about 700 steps with some results and uh, information what needs to be done on that host and to, to convert be successful. Uh, right now, we are checking uh, skipped uh, checks and also the checks that failed. But we, have, we are having some discussions about maybe we are not going to report the skipped checks because from time to time, uh, it could be, let's say, false positive error, or how to say it, you know, uh, some there could be some misconfiguration, the subscription, stuff like that, that's not really blocking for the upgrade. So uh, that's one change that we plan for the future. The later changes that uh, there's planned for 
better reporting of the tasks and the stuff. So as you can see right now, we are just you know putting the stuff to the output, but later we would like to somehow process the errors, you know, and show them uh, at the end of the job. So users immediately knows what is happening and they don't have to go over all the log and filter it, filter it by themselves. And yeah, that was all from me. One simple template with or one tool and one command. Um, any questions? I guess no. Yeah, thank you, Lars. I don't see any questions. Yeah, so we can move on to our next um, topic, which will be presented by Maria. Actually, Maria will cover the rest of the topics for today, total of four, uh, with one develop developer-focused demo. Uh, so Maria, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I have a bunch of uh, small topics. I will find my tab. I'm sorry, I have so many tabs. Hopefully it's this one, yes. Okay, I'll start with the small bug fix. Actually, technically too, I saw that in the demo here, uh, some people didn't have the fix and had two titles for a run job. Uh, Carolina did make a PR for it in remote execution, so that will be fixed. Uh, my actual topic is that the host groups are now shown with their full name, uh, with their parent name and their actual name. Before that, it was just their name without the parent, and that was confusing for some, in some cases. So just how th this is how it looks in the host group table, and now it's the same in the job wizard. And my second topic is Maria from UX updated uh, her job invocation detail page. Uh, she made a new design and she's looking for feedback. So if you have, if you're using it regularly, we would love to hear like what's the best case for you and how you would rather it work. And yeah, just read it through. There's a link in the agenda. Uh, another topic from Maria is in the host page, we have the parameters tab. And in there, we show the different parameters and their overrides. And we want to show the source of the override and the original value for the host parameter. So Maria has some options on how to present it. And she would love to hear like, which one would you rather have? Like which one will provide you the most uh, information because we're not sure if people want to see even all the all of the original values or just the la latest one and if they even have like so many different values for one parameter and that's all for the community and users uh, topics that I have my next topic will be about um, table index page uh, you saw Jeremy showed the host, the new host page, uh, which is also using this uh, component. This should, we're working on making like a generic component for all table pages. So you can just use it very simply by passing columns, titles, and just a URL, a header, controller name, the columns that you see here. And that will be the whole page and nothing else. Um, a simple example for that is the models page. A difficult example for that is the host page, which is more custom and has more features. So there's a range of options with there, and we're hoping to add more things to the table, to the table index page. And yeah, that's all I had. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Maria. Uh, I don't see any questions. Can go ahead and share my screen for the last time. Yeah, so the next demo uh, is in three weeks, and as usual, on November 30th. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, even though we're not streaming the demo live this time, you can always ask in the IRT 
in the RFC channel and questions you might have, and we will answer it after the demo. One of will publish it on YouTube, obviously. Yeah, I don't see any questions. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for all the presenters. And see you next time.